Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We turn now to the great Achube, and we're going to look at his short story, Civil Peace, on page 356, 357 and following. I want to actually begin, though, on page 355. Go there quickly. At 2B, make sure that you've written down that our focus at 2B will be theme. That is to say, the literary work's central idea, either by being directly stated or by implied through certain kinds of patterns. We also want to point out the philosophical assumptions that are being a part, uh, uh, that are understood as a part of the text, and as well the drawing of conclusions by recognizing key details. Now we played that game with Tolstoy's uh, land. Now we're going to turn to Achube and his civil peace. Let's meet him. Born in 1930, dies the 21st of March 2013. Achube is renowned for novel stories that explore the conflicts of modern Africans. Achubi was born in the Igbo tribe of Nigeria, grew up to pursue varied career as a university teacher, director of the Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation. According to one critic, quote, in the English language, he is the founding father of modern African literature, end quote. Achubi wrote his first and most celebrated novel, this one you want to pay attention to, Things Fall Apart, the 1958 offering. We actually study this sometimes in our curriculum at Worland High School. It's a brilliant, brilliant novel. In an effort to accurately portray the disruption of Igbo society, tribal society, by Western colonial rule, during the Civil War in Nigeria, Achibe's house was bombed. He fled, leaving behind a book of his that he had nearly finished printing. When he returned, a single copy of the book remained. Now, for the background for this story, Civil Peace, look under the uh, box on 357, the Nigerian Civil War. In 1960, the West African nation of Nigeria finally won independence from Britain. The Igbo, also spelled as I-G-B-O, one people of Nigeria seceded from the new country, setting up the Independent Republic of Biafra. Um, the brutal civil war followed, and in 1970, a defeated Biafra joined Nigeria. Civil peace unfolds in the aftermath of this war. All right? So we've got some cultural things that are happening in the story, which will obviously help us as we, uh, as we go forward. Um, just to do what we always do when we are good readers, we scan. Notice we've got some information on 362 about the Nigerian Civil War. You'll want to pay attention with a little map there to kind of give you a sense of where uh, Nigeria is, right? So let's go ahead now and enjoy the story. If life gives you lemons, make lemonade. A famous saying, right? In Civil Peace, this expression sums up the main character's ability to make the best of the difficult situations thrust upon him by a chaotic, lawless, post-Civil War society. Having survived with most of his family intact, our hero, protagonist, Jonathan, realizes flexibility is the key to success. <clears throat> if one business does not work, another one might. Even when thieves threaten his family and steal his money, Jonathan shows that a positive mental attitude helps one to adapt to change and loss. I have sophomores that say this is one of the most hopeful, hope-filled texts they've ever read. Let's take a look. You, you get to decide, all right? Let's learn about Jonathan and his challenges. It is a success story through and through. Here we go. Enjoy the reading. Follow along now. Pay attention. Civil Peace by Chinua Achebe. Jonathan Owengu counted himself extraordinarily lucky. Happy survival meant so much more to him than just a current fashion of greeting old friends in the first hazy days of peace. It went deep to his heart. He had come out of the war with five inestimable blessings, his head, his wife Maria's head, and the heads of three out of their four children. As a bonus, he also had his old bicycle, a miracle too, but naturally not to be compared to the safety of five human heads. The bicycle had a little history of its own. One day at the height of the war, it was commandeered for urgent military action. Hard as its loss would have been to him, he would still have let it go without a thought had he not had some doubts about the genuineness of the officer. It wasn't his disreputable rags, nor the toes peeping out of one blue and one brown canvas shoe, 
nor yet the two stars of his rank, done obviously in a hurry in Byro, that troubled Jonathan. Many good and heroic soldiers looked the same or worse. It was, rather, a certain lack of grip and firmness in his manner. So Jonathan, suspecting he might be amenable to influence, rummaged in his raffia bag and produced the two pounds with which he had been going to buy firewood, which his wife, Maria, retailed to camp officials for extra stockfish and cornmeal, and got his bicycle back. That night, he buried it in the little clearing in the bush where the dead of the camp, including his own youngest son, were buried. When he dug it up again a year later after the surrender, all it needed was a little palm oil greasing. Nothing puzzles God, he said in wonder. He put it to immediate use as a taxi and accumulated a small pile of Biafran money, ferrying camp officials and their families across the four-mile stretch to the nearest tarred road. His standard charge per trip was six pounds, and those who had the money were only glad to be rid of some of it in this way. At the end of a fortnight, he had made a small fortune of 115 pounds. Then he made the journey to Enugu and found another miracle waiting for him. It was unbelievable. He rubbed his eyes and looked again, and it was still standing there before him. But needless to say, even that monumental blessing must be accounted also totally inferior to the five heads in the family. This newest miracle was his little house in Ogui Overside. Indeed, nothing puzzles God. Only two houses away, a huge concrete edifice some wealthy contractor had put up just before the war was a mountain of rubble. And here was Jonathan's little zinc house of no regrets, built with mud blocks, quite intact. Of course, the doors and windows were missing and five sheets off the roof, but what was that? And anyhow, he had returned to Anuku early enough to pick up bits of old zinc and wood and soggy sheets of cardboard lying around the neighborhood before thousands more came out of their forest holes looking for the same thing. 360. He got a destitute carpenter with one old hammer, a blunt plane, and a few bent and rusty nails in his tool bag to turn this assortment of wood, paper, and metal into door and window shutters for five Nigerian shillings, or 50 Biafran pounds. He paid the pounds and moved in with his overjoyed family carrying five heads on their shoulders. His children picked mangoes near the military cemetery and sold them to soldiers' wives for a few pennies, real pennies this time, and his wife started making breakfast acara balls for neighbors in a hurry to start life again. With his family earnings, he took his bicycle to the villages around and bought fresh palm wine, which he mixed generously in his rooms, with the water which had recently started running again in the public tap down the road and opened up a bar for soldiers and other lucky people with good money. All right, let's pause for a second at level one. Notice all the miracles that are a part of this story. Now, I've had students that say, it's kind of interesting the things he accounts as miracles, so let's put this in our notes right away. We are clearly dealing with a setting where there is serious lack of resources. Would you agree with me? This is a time of intense deprivation. But let's notice what his miracles are. One, his wife's head, his three children's head, he lost one child. But they're all alive. Two, his bicycle, which notice is a big deal for him because it allows him to be able to raise enough money. Finally, three, he comes back to his original town and there's his house, the small shack, is there still intact. In other words, he's shocked that his house hasn't been destroyed like a number of other houses. In other words, this is a time, let's put it in our notes, this is a time of intense transition, intense challenges. But let's notice how Jonathan is always responding. Whatever happens, he's always looking for the best that he can accomplish in his life, economically, right? To try and work hard to gain what it is that he wants. I've had students that have said at 3B, i got to be honest, Mr. McGee, it's kind of hard for me to relate to this kind of a story because I can't imagine being in this level of deprivation. 
to have absolutely nothing and to be struggling, I have to admit, I might want to give up in a situation like this. Which is again why we'll call Jonathan not just our protagonist, but also our hero. Alright, so we're into the story now. We're on page 360. Let's imagine now where Achube is going to take us next in our story, right? At first he went daily, then every other day, and finally once a week to the offices of the Coal Corporation where he used to be a miner to find out what was what. The only thing he did find out in the end was that that little house of his was even a greater blessing than he had thought. Some of his fellow ex-miners who had nowhere to return at the end of the day's waiting just slept outside the doors of the offices and cooked what meal they could scrounge together in born vita tins. As the weeks lengthened and still nobody could say what was what, Jonathan discontinued his weekly visits altogether and faced his palm wine bar. But nothing puzzles God. Came the day of the windfall, when after five days of endless scuffles in queues and counter queues in the sun outside the treasury, he had 20 pounds counted into his palms as ex gratia award for the rebel money he had turned in. 361. It was like Christmas for him, and for many others like him, when the payments began. They called it, since few could manage its proper official name, Egg Russia. As soon as the pound notes were placed in his palm, Jonathan simply closed it tight over them and buried fist and money inside his trouser pocket. He had to be extra careful because he had seen a man a couple of days earlier collapse into near madness in an instant before that oceanic crowd because no sooner had he got his 20 pounds than some heartless ruffian picked it off him. Though it was not right that a man in such an extremity of agony should be blamed, yet Many in the queues that day were able to remark quietly at the victim's carelessness, especially after he pulled out the innards of his pocket and revealed a hole in it big enough to pass a thief's head. But of course, he had insisted that the money had been in the other pocket, pulling it out too to show its comparative wholeness. So one had to be careful. 362. Jonathan soon transferred the money to his left hand and pocket so as to leave his right free for shaking hands, should the need arise, though by fixing his gaze at such an elevation as to miss all approaching human faces, he made sure that the need did not arise until he got home. He was normally a heavy sleeper, but that night he heard all the neighborhood noises die down one after another. Even the night watchman, who knocked the hour on some metal somewhere in the distance, had fallen silent after knocking one o'clock. That must have been the last thought in Jonathan's mind before he was finally carried away himself. He couldn't have been gone for long, though, when he was violently awakened again. Who is knocking? whispered his wife, lying beside him on the floor. I don't know, he whispered back breathlessly. The second time the knocking came, it was so loud and imperious that the rickety old door could have fallen down. Who is knocking? he asked them, his voice parched and trembling. Natif man and him people, came the cool reply. Make you open the door. This was followed by the heaviest knocking of all. Maria was the first to raise the alarm. Then he followed, and all their children. Police all! Thieves all! Neighbors all! Police all! We are lost! We are dead! Neighbors, are you asleep? Wake up! Police all! This went on for a long time and then stopped suddenly. Perhaps they had scared the thief away. There was total silence, but only for a short while. You done finish? Asked the voice outside. Make we help you small. Oh yeah, everybody! Police all, thief man so, neighbors all, we don't know so, police all. There are at least five other voices besides the leaders. Jonathan and his family were now completely paralyzed by terror. Maria and the children sobbed inaudibly like lost souls. Jonathan groaned continuously. Right? 
So here we go. Let's write it down at level one. What happens next? He gets his, his money. He goes back. He's with his family in his small house. And then all of a sudden, the bad guys show up, knocking on the door. We take for granted today, don't we, that we can call 911 and all of a sudden we'll have law enforcement there to help us. The next time, for example, that you say something derogatory about law enforcement or the cops, right, consider the fact that if something like this happened to you and your family, your first instincts are to call for those very people that sometimes we want to denigrate and ask for help. That is to say, there's nobody coming. Notice now, Jonathan and his family are in a world of hurt. What exactly is it that's going to happen next? Go ahead and try and make a prediction real quickly. What do you think is going to happen next? Here we go. Let's watch what goes down. The silence that followed the thieves' alarm vibrated horribly. Jonathan all but begged their leader to speak again and be done with it. 363. My friend, said he at long last. We don't try our best for call them, but I think say them all the sleep all. So, what can we go do now? Some time you want call soldier? Or you want make we call them for you? Soldier better pass police, no be so? Now so, replied his men. Jonathan thought he heard even more voices now than before, and groaned heavily. His legs were sagging under him, and his throat felt like sandpaper. My friend, why you not they talk again? I they ask you, say, you want make we call soldier? No. All right, oh. Now make we talk business. We no be bad teeth. We no like for big trouble. Trouble done finish. War done finish. And all the katakata way they fall inside. No civil war again. This time not civil peace. No be so? Not so, answered the horrible chorus. What do you want from me? I am a poor man. Everything I had went with this war. Why do you come to me? You know people who have money. We all right. We no say you no got plenty money. But we serve, no got even a nini. So therefore, make you open this window and give us 100 pound and we go come out. Otherwise, we they come for inside now to show you guitar boy like this. A volley of automatic fire rang through the sky. Maria and the children began to weep aloud again. Ah, Missisi, they cry again. No need for that. We don't talk say we not good thief. We just take our small money and go no way early. No malice. I be we the malice at all, sang the chorus. My friends, began Jonathan hoarsely. I hear what you say and I thank you. If I had 100 pounds, look at my friend, no be play. We come play for your house. If we make mistake and step for inside, you no go like Amor. So therefore, to God who made me, if you come inside and find 100 pounds, take it and shoot me and shoot my wife and children. I swear to God, the only money I have in this life is this 20 pounds egg rasher they gave me today. Okay, time to go. Make you open this window and bring the 20 pound. We go manage them like that. There were now loud murmurs of dissent among the chorus. No lie, the man, the lie. It got plenty money. Make we go inside and search properly well. Wouldn't be 20 pound. Shut up, rang the leader's voice like a lone shot in the sky and silenced the murmuring at once. Are you there? Bring the money, quick. 364. I am coming, said Jonathan, fumbling in the darkness with the key of the small wooden box he kept by his side on the mat. At the first sign of light, as neighbors and others assembled to commiserate with him, he was already strapping his five-gallon demijohn to his bicycle carrier, and his wife, sweating in the open fire, 
was turning over a car of balls in a wide clay bowl of boiling oil. In the corner, his eldest son was rinsing out dregs of yesterday's palm wine from old beer bottles. I count it as nothing, he told his sympathizers, his eyes on the rope he was tying. What is egg Russia? Did I depend on it last week? Or is it greater than other things that went with the war? I say, let egg Russia perish in the flames. Let it go where everything else has gone. Nothing puzzles God. Now this is an interesting story because of the tension. Obviously we wonder what is going to happen. Jonathan, in the end, considers himself blessed that he's able to give away the last money he has and save his family. But what's even more interesting is the way he responds in terms of the next morning. Instead of saying, you should pity me, instead of whining and complaining about his situation, notice he and his family immediately ready to go right back to work, to keep working hard, to find what it is that they can make to sustain their life. That's level one. Let's jump now to level two. At 2A, what do you make of this line, nothing puzzles God? Jot down what you think that line means. A lot of students have pointed out that what that line really means is you shouldn't ever be shocked at anything that happens in a war-torn country when all kinds of crazy chaos is going around. Another reading of this might be a major theme of this story, namely, you have to be self-sufficient in times of tremendous devastation. You have to learn how to rely on yourself and to make it. Notice, we don't have any other place we can go in a situation like this. We have to make it on our own. A third med 